Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers, and it's time for a live movie commentary here on Rock and Robbie Live. That's right, Rock and Robbie Live. The show, it's the show where we uh, we go live a little bit, right? So tonight we're doing a live movie commentary to Dracula's Daughter. Dracula's Daughter came out in 1936 from Universal Horror. It's a fantastic film. It's a direct sequel to 1931's Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi. This one is starring Otto Kruger, Gloria Holden. Marguerite Churchill, and a few others. Music by Heinz Romeheld. Okay. It's written by Garrett Fort, produced by E.M. Asher, and of course directed by Lambert Hillier. But tonight we're watching Dracula's Daughter. So last week we did a frightfully fearful Friday here on Rockin' Robbie Live. And the idea of these is it's a movie commentary, right? So it's like if you want to watch the movie with me, that's what we're going to do. You can either watch the movie with me live right now or you can watch the movie with me at your own whenever you want to, like as soon as we start the movie. <clears throat> now, a quick little thing here, in case anybody's checking this out live and wants to join in, or those of you after the fact, so what's going on right now is that I already have the movie set to play directly starting, okay? So I've got the DVD here from the Dracula Legacy Collection. Um, if you have that, that's cool. But when you hit play, it's going to go ahead and go to this, like, dun-dun-dun, the universal screen, right? And then we're going to skip right past that, right? And when I say we're going to start, it starts right at the actual start of the film, <clears throat> just so everybody's on the page. Also, if you are here live with us, be sure to click that thumbs up button, even if you're not live. But if you are here live, be sure to go ahead and comment and let us know what's up as well. What you think as we're watching this movie. Dracula's Daughter from 1936. I really love this film. A little bit of a preamble waiting for more people in case they want to come in and check this out live. I absolutely love this movie. Um, it's a sequel to Dracula. It, direct, it starts directly as Dracula ends, as we will soon see. Um, it's got uh, Edward Van Sloan returning as Van Helsing, uh, Gloria Holden as Dracula's daughter. Um, it's a really cool movie. I like it a lot. <clears throat> so here we go. We're about to start the countdown here on Frightfully Fearful Fridays at Pop Culture Philosophers. We're doing Dracula's daughter, and here's the countdown. Five, four, three, two. One, and start the movie, everybody. All right, so right now I got the little airplane going across Universal. And, you know, I absolutely do adore these Universal um, picture, little preamble, whatever they're, they're called. <clears throat> Those little teasers, I love them. I love them. So, like I said, this movie came out in 1936 from Universal. What's interesting is that Dracula kind of kicked off a renaissance of horror over at Universal, right? In 1931. And then it kind of ended with this film in 1936. And it's a nice bookend to that first initial wave of Universal horror. Excuse me. Not counting, of course, the silent films like Phantom of the Opera, the Lon Chaney stuff. So this movie is actually very well shot. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Right now, I want to pay attention to that music by Heinz Romeheld. Romeheld. Um, Dracula didn't have a score. It was very effective that Dracula did not have a score. <clears throat> At least in my opinion, right? Turning up my volume a little bit so I can hear the, the movie. This movie's great. I love it. Okay, so it's a direct sequel to Dracula. As you can see right there, we got... Edward Van Sloan uh, returning as Van Helsing. This movie's about to start. It literally starts like 10 seconds after Dracula ends. I love it so much. If anybody's watching live, by the way, feel free to jump in. So the score is great. I love it. I think it's amazing. I really do. You know I'm a big Universal Horror fan. This is great stuff. So the music starts, and... Basically, the police are going to come down here, and they're going to find Van Helsing, who has just killed Dracula, and they're going to be like, you just killed this man, because there's a, an obvious stake right through his heart, you know what I'm saying? Um, which is funny, and Van Helsing the entire time is just like, matter-of-factly, yeah, I killed him. He was a vampire. There's Rainfield. His body. This is the only direct sequel to Dracula. 
there are movies like Son of Dracula, which we'll be doing next week. There are there's there's House of Dracula and he, Dracula appears in House of Frankenstein. Those movies aren't really so much connected. So there's Edward Van Sloan appearing again as Van Helsing right after he has killed Dracula. The police find him. And of course he gets arrested for murder. And a big part of this movie is about Edward Van Sloan's Van Helsing um, going on trial. Right? They also think he killed Ranfield. But he doesn't admit to that. But he, matter of fact, he just be like, yeah, I killed Dracula. He's a vampire. <laughs> but he can't prove that. If only it was a... Uh, the Joss Whedon verse, and he turned to dust. All right, you'll notice that dude right there on the left, he's in a lot of these films, playing comedic roles. So earlier in the year of 1936, this movie released in May, uh, May like 11th, I believe, of 1936, the day after my birthday. Of course, I wasn't born yet. I wasn't near born yet. We're not that old, right? That right there is a wax figure of Bela Lugosi as Dracula. I love these movies so much. So I thank you for the opportunity to, to watch them with y'all. See, vampires don't dust in this movie. Look how calm Van Helsing is, though. It's amazing. Bullshit. That's what they're, you know what I'm saying? That's what they're saying. Why does Van Helsing, Van Helsing needs to like, he needs some proof or he needs to, he should have got the F out of there. Ah, so we think. We're going to send this up to the big boys, y'all. Okay, that music's a little much, but it's because it's Scotland Yard, so it makes sense. Edward Van Sloan in this movie is actually, I think it's a better performance than Dracula. In Dracula, he's amazing. He's one of the best performances in that movie, but it's very, like, curt. In this one, he's a little bit more relaxed. It kind of works. He's just so cool. He's like, he's happy now. Dracula's dead. <laughs> So this movie is comedic, and it's because earlier, and I think that I think I think Bride of Frankenstein came out right before this. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Someone can check that for me if they're watching, and let me know in the comments. But James Whale had had added a lot of comedic value to movies like Invisible Man and The Bride of Frankenstein. I feel like in this movie they're really trying to do that as well. And this Van Helsing shtick is basically a part of that. If you notice the policeman, the the detective or commissioner, whoever this dude is from Scotland Yard, he they're they're playing it rather comedically, right? And Van Helsing is just straight up straight. But but they're straight as well. But it, it really does work into humor, and a lot more humor gets introduced into the film as it goes on. I would not say that this is the funniest universal horror film from the uh, 30s or 40s. But it is, I get what they were trying to do. But it's not as good as, say, the James Well work, which is The Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein, and The Old Dark House. Which are amazing films. If you've never seen them, you really should. So Van Helsing happens to have a cat that lives there in old, ye old England, England, played by Otto Kruger, right? And he's going to wind up kind of having this like little romance with Dracula's daughter. Dracula's daughter is interesting. We'll talk more about it when she shows up. This movie's kind of, originally they wanted the sequel to be based on Dracula's Guest, which Dracula's Guest was a part of the novel of Dracula by Bram Stoker that got edited out. Um, and then the manuscript was later on released as a short story, right? Um, they wanted to do Dracula's Guest, but uh, Bram Stoker's widow, uh, the deal just did not work out between her and Universal. So they kind of took some ideas and then they developed their own thing on Dracula's daughter. 
But what's really cool is that it is a direct sequel to Dracula. Right now, we are right after Dracula. Now, Bela Lugosi does not appear in this film, just a wax figure of him. Um, he was apparently offered the role, didn't really work out, something didn't happen. It's really unfortunate that he's not in here, but I do think that this is a great film. That dude is straight up, he's, he's in Invisible Man, maybe he's in Bride of Frankenstein, maybe he's just in that one, I don't know. One of the cool things about the Universal Horror films is that they are connected. And they're also connected because they use the same character actors. And it's really fun. But you see that with the accent they're using and, and like that character in particular, this is meant to be humorous. Now we're about to be introduced into Dracula's daughter. Countess whatever her name is. I never remember it. But Gloria Holden plays this character. And she has an assistant. Oh my goodness. The assistant is uh, something with an S. What is it? Sandor. And it's Irving Pitchell. He is one of the best parts of this film. He's kind of like the Dr. Pretorius of this film. Because Universal, and just like films do today, they really take, you know, if it works, if it worked before, we're going to apply that same formula, Right. You know, like, you can definitely see how, like, it, the MCU at times, as, as great as it is, sometimes it gets a bit formulaic. And it really hurts sometimes. Especially, I think it really hurts it in Phase 2. These Universal Monster movies were like that as well. They were very formulaic. If something worked, it w they would redo it. Like we were talking about last week, Dracula was basically redone as The Mummy. It's pretty much the exact same film. This is almost the same film... As Bride Frankenstein, a little bit. It's kind of got the same structure. It starts off as a direct sequel, then it goes off into its own story, and 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 the 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 introduction of certain characters, and then it's kind of mimicked in this film. Right now, we're getting that comedic value in this film. Now, I haven't watched this film near as much as I have, say, Dracula, which we did last week. So, this is probably, though, still, like, I mean, I'm in double digits. But this movie is hardly ever talked about. And so many people talk about Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman and the Mummy and the Bride and the Invisible Man and all that stuff and the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Nobody talks about Dracula's Daughter. And, of course, it's just this one movie, but it's really a very impactful film. It's a very important film, and I think it's a very innovative film. And I actually really, really like it. And like I said, the this was kind of the end of the horror wave. Of course, three years later, um, Son of Frankenstein came out. I think that's a great film, to be honest with you. Um, but the, the, the popularity was definitely waning on the Universal monster films, but it did pick back up in the 40s with like things like Wolfman and Creature from the... Well, Creature was in the 50s, right? But it's kind of at the, another wave or tail end of that second wave, but... Here we go. Introdu introduction of Countess... God, what's her name? I got it right here. Maria Zaleska. That's right. Zaleska. I love the name. Instantly, he's hypnotized. Now, this is interesting because she plays a very similar role to Bela Lugosi in Dracula. She's pretty much playing almost the same character, but she does have this conflict. She doesn't necessarily want to be a vampire. And I think that's a really interesting way to take this story, because she could have easily just been another bloodthirsty vampire and done the movie exactly. But this is what makes it a little bit different than Dracula that came before it. But like I said, it does reflect and mirror a little bit of Bride of Frankenstein, because that one, the monster is getting a little bit more humanized. And this one, we have the monster getting a little bit more humanized as well, but being tempted by this other figure. And whether it's the monster or the creator, Victor himself, or Henry in the movies for Frankenstein. Um, but there you go, right? So it's the same idea. Whether it's the Countess here, or whether it's... I just hypnotized in her eyes, you know? Or whether it's uh, Dr. Frankenstein. He's being, t he's being tempted. He's trying to go clean, but he's being tempted by Pretorius. In this one, she's being tempted by Xandor. Alcoholism is so encouraged back in the 30s. It's post-prohibition. 
This is normal. By the way, they're trying to ban this. F that, right? Dude's completely hypnotized out. Comedic value right there. It's, 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 it's played up for laughs. So Holden's already made her appearance as Dracula's daughter, Zaleska. Maria Zaleska. There's old Otto. So she comes and she steals. No, that's not Otto, my bad. I was wrong. Oh. Those sound effects. We were talking about that last week on Dracula. Those sound effects are great. There's Xander. Xandor. Ugh. So good. Xandor, played by Irving Pitchell. Pitchell, something like that. Look at that shot. It's eerie. It's, it's Catholic feeling, almost. It's almost like the Virgin Mary. It's almost like an inverted Mary. The inferior mother, if you will. But she represents more Bina, if you dig what I'm saying. To me. So she's burning Dracula's body because she thinks that's going to break the curse that has turned her into Dracula. Now, she is not necessarily Dracula's daughter. They just mentioned that Dracula died 500 years ago, so he's like 500 years old. And Dracula's daughter later on gets mentioned that it's only 200 years old. Now, of course, I cannot remember the name of this YouTube channel, but there's this cat on YouTube that does this really... He's got a long name. It starts with a Z. And he just recently did a video on this, and he does this really cool thing where he like dresses up in a, or at least for this video, he dressed up in a vampire cape, you know, and he had like a set and all that stuff, and it felt fun, something like Sven Gulli or those other old school Chili Billy things. Um, that's kind of my inspiration for things like this, but I don't have the big elaborate set. But he did a really good video about this movie. It's like a few minutes, like 13 minutes long or something, 14, something like that. So she thinks she's free. She just wants to live a normal life. So just like you know, Henry Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, just like the monster, try to be cool. Now, Xander, the entire time here, is like Pretorius, the tempter. He is constantly bringing her down, whispering dark, negative things into her ear. And he represents that negative side that we all have inside of us. That little voice inside that's telling you that you're not good enough, that you can't do this, that you're always going to be crap. That's what he represents. And I love I love the struggle in this film of, of the vampire wanting to be... Look, that was Brooks's bookshop, y'all. He's got the doofiest hair, too. This has got to be like Snape's great-grandfather or something. I just want to take a moment and just let this dialogue play out because it's great. His performance, Holden's performance, it works so well. I love this film. I hope you're watching this along with me at some point because this is a movie that I think a lot of people don't know about and don't appreciate. And this is something that's really good. These performances anchor this film. This is a great moment and a great example of what I'm talking about when I'm saying that Xander is basically trying to bring her down. He's like, why are you trying to, to deny what you are in a way? And we all deal with this. See, I love this dialogue. It's so good. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up button. This dude's crazy. It's almost like that scene in Reefer Madness. It really is. That music, though. It's good stuff. So even though I, I said last week that I, one of my favorite things about Dracula is that it did not have a score, this is even better like i mean it does have a score and it works and it works to maximum effect now i don't think dracula should have had a score i think it's actually fortunate that it didn't but this movie deserves it and needs it 
This music really helps carry the movie. Because it's broken up through comedy as well. It just went from a comedy kind of set piece, like a mystery, into like something very creepy and very, very, and especially for its time, very unnerving. There she goes. Hunting. She has amazing eyes, just like Bela Lugosi, that really carry that. She's got a very, like, I guess it's Eastern European features, it seems to me, at least. Why do people not walk around top hats anymore? Let's do that. So I do love the idea that she's trying to not be a vampire. But she is fighting against her nature. And that's something that Xander represents, is the fighting against that nature. But we can all rise above that nature. Now, how does a vampire rise above that nature? Well, I guess... Killing themselves? She thinks it was burning her sire... So it's, it's mentioned, I talked about the age difference earlier. I guess the idea is that it's not actually Dracula's physical daughter, but someone he turned down the road. So she just went out and she fed, you know. She just she had to do what she had to do. But she's not, she didn't feel good about it. What's up, Brett? How are you doing? Good to see somebody here. We're watching Dracula's Daughter. We're 18 minutes in this film, and this movie's only an hour and 11 minutes. Brett, have you ever seen this movie, Dracula's Daughter? From 1936. And yeah, I do have all the lights out. I thought, I thought I'd give a spooky flair to it. I also got my illustrated version of the novel Dracula right there, illustrated by Becky Cloonan. It's really, really cool. And we should revive Top Hats. That's the exact same shot, I believe, at the beginning there. Um, that wide angle. I think that's a... It is underrated. Absolutely. That's, that's the same shot from Dracula. Brett, we were talking about how this movie... It does mirror Dracula, but it, it does have a difference to it, of course, because um, um, the, the Dracula's daughter doesn't want to be a, a vampire. You know, she's trying to cure herself. Of course, she has Xander... Always in her ear being like, don't fight it. There's dark darkness out there that needs you. Whatever. And I love that character so much. It's great. But this movie's also really mimicking and mirroring. There's Otto. Mimicking and mirroring Bride of Frankenstein. It's trying to get that James Whale humor without the James Whale touch. But I do think it works. And I do think this film is very severely underrated. I love it so much. I love the way they talk. I watched some YouTube video a while ago about how this is like some kind of fake cinematic American slash British accent or something. Oh, yeah, Brett, me too. I love all the Universal stuff for sure. All right, now she is... That's Marguerite, right? Yeah, that's Janet. Her whole thing here with Otto's character is very comedic. And this movie does kind of maybe not balance out the comedy with the horror aspect of it as well. But I do find it very endearing and charming. So this is the dude that Van Helsing is saying, you need to talk to this dude because y'all think I'm crazy because you think I killed this dude, but he's a vampire. And this is the only dude that can believe me. Of course, he's not going to believe him. But of course, he winds up confronting Dracula's daughter. Zaleska, I have to keep looking, and it works. It's, it's, I love this film so much. I have a story, and I've been working on it for a long time. Maybe one day people will see it, but the main character is inspired by Zaleska in this film. I think they have a nice little banter back and forth. It's funny to me. He is very demeaning to her, but you also see a very, a very much a, a love and professionalism that they have between the two of them. Edward Van Sloan is so straight in this film. He is so just like, you can't, you know, you can't, this dude's been dead for 500 years. You can't just, that's not your defense, man. We got to come up with something different. Can we just, let me convince them that you're crazy. You know, something like that. 
We can bring back top hats, but we cannot bring back pants like that. That's ridiculous. They're like tucked into his socks. What's up with that? I've never understood that. That never was cool. Never. Can't have ever been cool. He's convincing this dude. He's not he's trying to convince this dude. Van Helsing's trying to convince this dude, and he's just it's so funny. Van Helsing's screwed. I mean, nobody's gonna believe this dude's a vampire. He just said it. You can't defend yourself quoting folklore. It's not gonna work. Duh. Van Helsing thinks it's good. Well, then I'm going to go to jail, but I'll be happy because I just killed a monster. <coughs> Excuse me. So getting back to this, this movie does a great job of juggling that dude's stuff with the Van Helsing stuff with the stuff with Zaleska. That's Jeffrey Garth, Dr. Garth. Heck yeah. Maria Zalaska. I like that they flip it, though. One of my favorite things about this movie is that they do flip that. And she is able to be just as seductive, just as hypnotic, just as mesmerizing as Bela Lugosi was. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, you got the the obvious plot of the jealous assistant and the, the, the love Sam Diane tension thing that's going on there. It doesn't balance as well as some of the stuff in Bride of Frankenstein, but I think it still works. A throwback to Dracula. She never drinks wine. I never drink wine. Only monster energy drinks. Such a great movie. And they're so paced. They're paced so well. They're fast paced. And not just because they're short. But it's because they're efficient. It goes beyond that. It's a beautiful looking film. It really is. This dude, this fella's Van Helsing. You should have to stay through this fella's heart. It's it's so goofy. It's it's on purpose. It's because she burnt it. I spirited him away. Everybody knows some dick bag like this guy. <laughs> So in this one, you have Zaleska quoting what Van Helsing quoted in the first Dracula film, which was amazing. There is so much you can do with Van Helsing, Brett, including make him an action star with Hugh Jackman. <laughs> but I love the uh, bits in Tomb of Dracula about the, the, the descendants of the characters from the novel. The Van Helsings, the Harkers, all that. Drake. Oh, they are. Do you remember when uh, I never got these because I already had them and I didn't want to double dip. Like, you can't double dip too many times. You know, I bought Evil Dead so many times on various versions of VHSs and DVDs and Blu-rays and the same with these Universal Monster movies. And, you know, I got all these DVD ones and I remember having all the VHSs and then I got all the DVDs, the Legacy Collections, and then I got the, the, the Universal Monsters Blu-ray collection that had all the main films and now they're releasing them as these Blu-ray sets with all these extra ones and I'm like, oh. But do you remember the ones of the main ones that Alex Ross did the, uh, the artwork for? Oh, they were so beautiful. And I love almost everything Alex Ross has done and I know, Brett, that you're a big Alex Ross fan. But those Universal Monster uh, images that he did, I think are some of his best work. And he captured the, the black and white, the framing, the composition. It's so elegant. You know, I think I mentioned this last week when we talked about 
Dracula when we were watching that one. But, you know, when, when Mel Brooks wanted to make Young Frankenstein, he didn't have a cinematographer that knew how to shoot black and white the way that they were, they were shot back in the day. They had to, like, find some dude or, like, research some stuff. You know, they had to, they had to find a very specific talent. And you're right. You can you can pause any scene and it looks beautiful. It's like an Ang Lee film. Some more of this this comedic Sam and Diane mess. <laughs> I like it though. I think it's fun. I think it's charming. You know, I'd like to see Alex Ross do uh, Maria Zaleska, Dracula's daughter. That'd be cool. I don't know if I have never seen one if he has. But I almost want to go, I mean, they're probably going up in price, but they were, I think they were Blu-ray 10s, right, with the Alex Ross covers? Like, those are just so good. Why did I not get those? Because I already had the box set, that's why. Great performances here. Such a great scene. So this movie was eventually followed up with Son of Dracula. We'll be doing that next week. It's got Lon Chaney Jr. in it, but it's not really comp it's not really worried about continuity or anything like that. A lot of the Universal Monster movies kind of screw continuity after this point. <laughs> they really do. This one really does respect the continuity and does something different. And it's actually a bold move from Universal to release this film this way. It didn't have Bela Lugosi in it. it. didn't have Dracula in it. Except for like a wax figure that got burnt up. But those of us that love these classic films, there are a lot of us that really appreciate this film. It's, like I said, this movie's not as rip roariously as funny as the James Wells stuff. Like, The Old Dark House cracks me up. Invisible Man cracks me up. Bride of Frankenstein is probably one of the best horror sequels ever, partly because that comedy works so well. This doesn't work as well. It's jarring. The way we just went from this scene to this scene to this scene, right? But, I'm not trying to spend this whole movie apologize, like being an apologist for Dracula's daughter, but I will be because I think it's just one of the best. I'm right there with you, Brett. Brett said, not a lot of people understand the beautiful nuances in these films. And it's not a thing to say, you know, like, well, we know better than you. You just don't know. A lot of people just never checked it out. To a lot of people, these old black and white movies are very slowly paced. They're a little bit boring. I understand that. I get it. We're used to a more snappy, poppy thing nowadays but it doesn't necessarily work you know like they have failed two times three times i should say i will i'll go ahead and say three times they have failed three times to relaunch this universal monsterverse right the van helsing movie by stephen summers with uh hugh jackman i like the film but it's bad it's so bad but i like it because it it, it does throw back to these these films you know then they had Dracula Untold. That was supposed to launch a new connected universe thing like the MCU, but with these monsters. And this is the first cinematic universe if you really think about it. These movies connect eventually, especially in the 40s, you know. That's when it happens. They all connect. Dracula connects with Frankenstein, connects with Wolfman, um, connects with Ab and Costello, and through that, connect with the mummy. <laughs> they never did one that had the mummy with the other three. But we know people like Mike Mignola are big fans of this because like House of the Living Dead by him and Richard Corbin, the Hellboy story, is a big just love fest for like House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein, Abbott and Costello, Meet Frankenstein. I love those films. I love them so much. And then with the Tom Cruise mummy movie, that was once again supposed to launch a universal monsterverse, a, a tied in cinematic universe. You know, they had big plans. They had Angelina Jolie and Javier Bardem signed up for Bride of Frankenstein. They had um, Johnny Depp tied into The Invisible Man. Um, it all fell away. They're still making that Invisible Man film. I never saw that mummy film. But you can't make these movies the way that you make movies today. You can't Fast and Furious the Universal Monster films. You can't do it. 
And that seems like that's what they've been trying to do, and you can't do that. You really need someone who understands and respects the nuance, the tone, the atmosphere of these films. And the comedy of these films. Once again, we're in another comedic scene. You know what I really thought captured the spirit was that the Stephen Summers Mummy movies, the first two, Mummy and Mummy Returns, I think it kind of captures the spirit, but it doesn't capture the tone. It doesn't capture the atmosphere. It captures the adventurous spirit of the Mummy sequels. It doesn't capture anything from the Mummy with Boris Karloff whatsoever. And he failed miserably with Van Helsing. There's some over-the-top performances. It is a love letter, and I love the movie because of that, but it is not a good movie. But I do like it. <laughs> I love their Dracula because he's so over the top. But it's just a lot of people, you know, you're just not used to watching films like this. A lot of people won't watch a movie that's black and white. A lot of people won't watch a movie that's old school like this. But more people should. So she thinks that maybe something is, you know, she burned up Dracula's body. So maybe if I just have some psychological help, maybe that will cure me of what's going on inside. Now, of course, Xander's like, oh, are you going out to kill that tempter? He's the ultimate enabler. What a creepy scene here. What a creepy actor. <coughs> just coming up and snatching on people that's terrible never believe somebody like that so she thinks maybe with psychological help it's all in her mind that she's a vampire so one of the things is that she's kind of setting this up. She's going to paint tonight. She needs a model. He's going to go get her a model, right? This leads to a very awkward scene, okay? <laughs> but she's the idea is that she's going to resist temptation by putting temptation in front of her. She's almost, in a way, already caving in. And he's, of course, enabling her. Now, some people that say, that say that this is a very monumental, milestone-y type moment in film because this is one of the first vampire lesbian scenes in a film and it does possibly have that connotation of course like we were talking about bram stoker's dracula was filled with that idea of sexual like repressiveness and, and things like that and it was a very sensual book and bela's performance holden's performance this scene as well was probably very controversial for its day But that Lighthouse trailer looks amazing. Possibly. Still has to be coherent. <laughs> I'm really pumped for that Lighthouse movie, though. Willem Dafoe, Robert Pattinson, that looks amazing to me. Tell me, how long have we been on this rock? Two days? Two years? Whatever he said. It looks amazing to me. I love it. Me and both, uh, me and Justin are super pumped for that movie. So this is a very cliche scene. I don't know if this is one of the first scenes that you ever have of, of somebody luring somebody into their studio to pose for a painting or a photos or something like that. And then you have some kind of awkwardly sexual scene going on. This may be one of the first, though. And I think that at the time, this was probably pretty controversial and racy. Very tame by today's standards. But obviously, it's place in the story. Lesbian vampires have become quite a trope. A lot of people say this is the first instance of that. And it's not necessarily completely clear, but it is definitely possibly implied. Definitely easy to interpret the scene that way. And what's up, Boana Beast? How are you doing?
Now, obviously, she's not going to be able to resist the temptation. So she's trying to resist the temptation. She doesn't want to feed or kill, and it doesn't work. I love that pan up, by the way, to that weird, creepy mask. That's loud and chaotic. <laughs> it's quite a cut scene for its day. There she is. She's dead. She's done. Somebody go help that woman. No, nah, that woman did. I should do one of these with Jelani or Brooks. That would be way fun. Watching a movie with Jelani is quite the experience. I really like this character. Strong, she's strong-headed. She knows who she is, what she's doing. I like her. Strong-headed, strong-willed. The hell is wrong with me? So earlier today, I was a little bit late getting onto the stream tonight because our good buddy and member of the excitable PCP crew, Mike the Voice Matthews, had his first photo gallery. That's right, his first gallery show was tonight, and it was awesome. Lots of people came out to say what's up, including the lead singer himself. Super cool. Super good night over at the Low Mill Arts Center. I'm very proud of Mike the Voice Matthews. Check him out on Instagram. It's like at, I think it's Mike006 or something like that. Go on to the PCP Army and we'll be linking it. The crew would be killer for these movies. What? Oh, yeah, the crew, our crew. Yeah, I got you. I thought you meant Motley Crew because of the way you typed out crew. <laughs> Mike is such an amazing photographer. He's done he's done photography for us, of course. Um, most of the really cool black and white photos you see of me um, are from Mike. A lot of the photos that you see of me that are really good are from Mike. And also my friend James Lineback, who's also a great photographer. But Mike is really like coming up. He loves music. He has a passion for the local indie indie scene. He's got a passion for that scene that's he's he's wound up connecting with bands in Nashville. He's always in the Nashville music scene, he's very connected there. Um, his show was called "I'm with the Band," and it was a bunch of um, like you know music acts that he caught. And his his he captures he captures people in the moment so well. He does an amazing job with his photography. His Instagram page is amazing. But because of his connection with these bands, he's going on he goes on tours with them. And this year, he's about to go on to the Kiss Cruise. Because they're playing on the Kiss Cruise. And, uh, and then when he gets done with that, he's going to go on a tour with Filter to celebrate 20 years of title record, which is like my favorite Filter album. And that's super cool. I'm so envious of Mike. That's amazing. I'm so happy for him and proud of him. He's amazing. So conveniently, as Van Helsing is trying to play up his innocence and the fact that he didn't kill a man he killed dracula who was already dead so he can't be put away for murder and his friend who is a psychologist um happens to show up and and try to help him out and then it just so happens that dracula's daughter is there and she happens to feed on this woman who winds up in front of this dude and then he's all like oh man maybe there's something up with this they won't believe van helsing but they'll believe this dude even though him and Van Helsing are friends, I really think that in today's world, they'd just be like, you're just his buddy. You're just trying to get him off. There's no such thing as vampires. What's wrong with you? Now, of course, they have that woman there. They have no idea why she's having this blood loss or whatever. I'm just saying, where's Dr. Seward? <laughs> where's Dr. Seward? Where's Mina Murray? Where's Jonathan Harker? Where are the people that can back up what Van Helsing's saying? They ditched this dude out. At the end of Dracula, Jonathan comes down, grabs Mina, and leaves. And Van Helsing's like, I'll kill Dracula. He kills him and gets arrested. And they never show up and be like, nah, we, we going to take... They never speak up for this dude. They're, they're douches. Where are they at? I just thought about that for the first time ever. Like, where are Jonathan and Mina and Dr. Seward? Where in the hell are they? They're letting Van Helsing take the rap for all of them. That's terrible. A 
a little bit more lore. The box of soil. That's something that a lot of vampire movies don't quite take into account anymore, but some of them do, and it's really neat. It's not just a coffin they have to be in. They have to be in their native soil. It means they have to be laid in dirt from their native land. So here's a question. Let's say your native land is Canada, right? And then one day, Canada and the U.S. join forces and become the United North America or something, right? Does it? Can you now have soil from Kentucky used? I don't know. It's an interesting thought. <laughs> like if you if you were born in the Texas area when it was Mexico, right? And you're you're like a Mexican vampire, and you you have Mexican soil. When it became Texas, is your soil from your your town no longer valid? That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Maybe one day I'll tackle that in the story. Fred, it is time for me to write a comic. Matt, Mike's not going to write a comic, though he does have some good ideas for stories. And me and him both have always wanted to do story and do especially movies and stuff like that. That's just way too complicated of a process now for my life. But I do plan on writing a comic. I plan on writing a few. I need to get on that. I need to develop some strategies. So after we're done with Comics Revisited Season 2... Um, I'm really going to plan out Season 3 a lot better and fit it in with the schedule a lot better. I'm trying to do more here on YouTube. I'm trying to get better um, at the, the video production. I'm trying to learn more about that and, and, and upgrade what we're doing because we're hitting a, a respectable amount of subscribers now on the channel. And uh, we want to level up. And in the midst of all that, I want to start creating content as far as comic books go. Now, of course, I have already edited a comic book um, really helped develop it a lot with my buddy Lance. Um, it's mostly all his thing. But I had a big influence, I would say. But if you like me, if you want to support my work, definitely check out Black Spec from Dance Panda Comics. You can find it on Comixology. You can find it on dancepandacomic.com. So we got about 30 minutes left in this film. Maybe a little bit less. I'm going to keep it running. The film is going to continue, but I do have to take a bathroom break. So if you're watching the movie along with me, keep the movie playing. I'll be right back here on Frightfully Fearful Fridays on Rock and Robbie Live. And we are back. <laughs> Brett, I didn't miss all the best parts, but this is a really good part. This is, okay, so this movie's got a lot of, like, it's got a lot of comedy in it. It's got a lot of little, like, fun little bits with Van Helsing and this doctor dude, Jeffrey, Dr. Garth. It's got some, but this is one of the nicest moments of the performance from Gloria Holden. I really think Gloria Holden does an absolutely fantastic job. Like I said, there's a vampire story that I've, I've been working on for a long time. Originally, I planned it on being a movie. But now I've, I feel like I'm going to make it a comic book. I was originally going to put it in 12 issues. Now I'm thinking about fitting it into five. But my main character of that movie, I mean of that of that story, whether it's a movie or a comic book, it would probably be a comic book. Hopefully someone will pick it up and do a movie, right? Completely based on Zaleska, that character. Visually, um, not quite so much in character. There are moments of the, more like a modern day version of the character. Or a 2003 version of the character, because it's a period piece. 
because that's when I first that's when I first wrote it. I first wrote the story in 2003, so it's going to still be in 2003, damn it. Because the music is very important to me in the story, and so the music's still there. And I'm going to try to figure out a way to in- involve music, like a soundtrack, into the story. More than just like giving you a soundtrack to listen to. It'll be tied in through dialogue and narration. Anyway, whatever. What's up, Dylan? Dylan's comic book rants. How are you doing? Good to see you. We're watching Dracula's Daughter right now. We are 47 minutes, 48 minutes at this exact moment into the film. We've only got like 21 minutes left or so, 22. Near in the end. But if you've never seen Dracula's Daughter, you totally should. You can get it in the Dracula Legacy Collection, available at like Walmart's, for instance, right now, because it's near in Halloween time. One of the reasons why I'm doing these like little movie commentaries on Friday nights is because I managed to free up some time here on Friday nights at times. It would not always be the case. But it's Halloween time for me. It's the end of it's the end of September. It's well enough time to start a horror fest. So this is my horror fest. You know, I don't have enough we used to always like gather the crew together. We would watch like sixty movies in like one month. Um, we would watch like a hundred movies in two months. Eventually we started one time we started horror fest in the middle of August, right. And continued it through the middle of November. Cause we just love horror films <clears throat> and love revisiting them. Unfortunately, we're all busy people. Now we're all, all more adults than we used to be more adult than we used to be. So we don't really get the time as much anymore. And so that's kind of what this is for me. So I definitely need to get like one of the crew on here for one of them. A little bit of a love triangle here. It's a little cheesy. Like I said, the Sam and Diane and, you know, that's Kirstie Alley right there. Sander is my favorite, though, in this film. Well, I love Zaleska. She's just brilliant. I love the performance. So she she's not dead, but she did get got. Thank you, Brett. I'm, I'm glad to do them. I love them. I have a lot of fun with them. I, I, I would watch these movies anyway. So why not watch them with y'all? Next week we'll do Son of Dracula. I'll try to get House of Dracula in. And then we're going to move on to Lost Boys and Near Dark. I'm very excited about those ones. I think a lot of people are going to have fun watching Lost Dark. I mean Lost Dark. What? I just combined them into one movie. Lost Dark. New idea for a story. Lost Dark. It's actually not bad. Raiders of the Lost Dark. What? Vampires of the Lost Dark. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll throw it in. With, I'll fold it in with my Houdini idea. Because I have an idea for Houdini, and it's a great idea. I love it. But the idea is that you know it's horror time and all that stuff. It's Halloween time, horror time. It's Halloween time, right? I love it. It's my favorite time of the year. Baseball's wrapping up. Postseason's about to start. Football's back. Pumpkin spice, I love that shit. Pumpkin beer, stuff like that. Horror, Halloween decorations. I love all of it. Maybe one day I'll, I'll dare to do something cheesy and, and, and be dressed up in like some kind of costume and have like some kind of cool macabre set. Instead, I just got my like Dracula, you know, some of my collection back there. But we did a P, uh, PCP Army poll, the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. We did a poll. And, and everybody voted for Dracula slash vampires for the focus this year. But maybe I'll continue doing this post-Halloween every so often on Frightfully Fearful Fridays. Because they're really, really fun. So he's using hypnotism to understand, you know, and this is something fun to me is, is the way that hypnotism is used in these old movies. They still use them today, but they don't use it as a plot device near as much as they used to, do they? What's up, Icy Cold Milk? How you doing? Hope life's treating you well. Right now we're watching Dracula's Daughter. Universal Horror, one of my favorites. It's old school. I love it. The shot right there with the light and the fan, it's pretty cool. I do like it. I like it a lot. 
And now she's gone. She gone. This is what that Hall & Oates song is about. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Like, I have to tell you that. Damn. What's this dude from? He's in a lot of stuff, isn't he? Is he in The Wolfman? One of the dudes in The Wolfman was in Trading Places. It's not this dude, is it? I don't know. This dude's what? Otto... Otto Kruger. I hit the wrong one. Oh, that music, though, is so good there. He was not in The Wolfman. <laughs> but there is some dude that was in The Wolfman that's also in Trading Places. Just so you know. But it's not this dude. But I feel like I recognize this dude from something else. The old school phones. The old school globes. This movie doesn't pop. It doesn't have as much of a scintillating pace as the James Well films. But it still works. We're nearing the end of the film and it feels like we're not quite building up to a climax yet. But through his hypnotism, he figured out that it is Zaleska and she's probably a vampire. Or that there is a vampire. Sure, old chap, it's a, it's a vampire. Idiot, that's a Guatemalan red. <laughs> what? What a, what a dick bag. <laughs> See, they're trying to do the James Well thing, but it doesn't work as well, does it? I wish this movie would end with Hobbs killing that dude. Just being like, ah, ha ha. How's that for being facetious? They don't do entrances like they used to, do they? Be sure to hit that thumbs up button, everybody. Oh, Joe, thank you so much. Even Count Chocula enjoying the commentary. That's right, Count Chocula and company, they are back in stores right now. I haven't gotten my boxes yet, but they are totally in my area. I know where they are, and I'm going after them tomorrow. The last time I ate the Count Chocula, Frankenberry, and Booberry, though, was in May. Because I saved boxes. I'll buy a stock, to, so I have them almost year-round. Mostly so around my birthday time in May, I have Count Chocula to eat. But it's great to eat Count Chocula and watch a vampire movie from the Universal Classic Days. See, this is a great dialogue here. I really like this. I think it's well written. You must be insane. Draculas? The curse of the Draculas! In case you didn't know. <laughs> Gloria Holden did not want to be typecast. She was very nervous about this and wanted to pl play it in a very certain way. She saw what had happened to Bela Lugosi's career. 
She didn't want to go that route. I'm not really familiar with any other work from her, though. I do like old movies, but I mostly know the famous classic ones. But I've watched every single one of these Universal ones over and over and over again. Even if you just like joining us here on these live movie commentaries, just to chill. There's that dude again. Oh, my goodness. This dude's voice. This dude's voice. Oh, this dude's great. I wish we could get this guy back in movies today. I don't know. She went out a long time ago. Somewhere in Chelsea, of all places. Have you found a better party? I love this dude's carry. It's so ridiculous. In a horror movie today, he would be got. There's not as many, as much death in these movies, though. But there is danger. So it's all coming together. All these various story arcs coming together. I wonder if Van Helsing's going to play a part. Oh, look who just showed up. Dracula's daughter. What's great is these very accomplished actors are giving their all in this movie. And they have to, especially back in 1936, they have to have read this script and been like, you've got to be effing kidding me. You've got to be, you got to be kidding me. But they play it so sincerely. It doesn't work that way, dude. A special treatment right there. Even if you like watching these things, though, just because, you know, you enjoy the channel and, 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 and all that stuff, I really do appreciate it. But I really highly encourage you to watch these movies. Oh, the telegraph montage scene. A classic. This is probably a very, like, of the time, this is really a groundbreaking scene. <laughs> All that montage. Brett says, that dialogue was great. Like I'm saying, so underrated. Such a beautiful thing. You got to remember what was going on at the time. It was the alternative. Yeah, it's good stuff. How many times have you said that? I knew I should have turned off my telephone last night. I love how Van Helsing it went from prisoner to advisor. Now they're willing to believe him. Where, once again, are Jonathan, Mina, and Dr. Seward? Where the hell are they? Why are they not speaking up? Maybe they got the F out of there. Maybe they're like, we're going to America. Maybe there aren't vampires there. <laughs> But Brett, you're right, and the dialogue is so good, and its delivery is so good. Not to sound like that guy, but they don't make them like they used to. It's so funny. How serious was that? Stop him! He's going to his death! That's probably stock footage. That probably is too. Maybe it's not. Who knows? I really feel like they were trying to cap... They were Apparently James Well was offered this movie. Um, Dracula's Daughter. And he turned it down. Didn't work out. But he did do Bride of Frankenstein, um, The Old Dark House, the original Frankenstein, and and uh, the, the Invisible Man. The Invisible Man and Bride of Frankenstein and The Old Dark House really do merge humor and horror very well. And it's something to, that's become a staple of a great horror film is to have those moments of comedic relief. 
of the release of tension. It's something very important to horror films. They throw it here. Now, here's one thing that's really cool. We were talking about how the horror renaissance kind of started with Dracula. And then they had some movies. They were successful. Frankenstein, The Mummy, um, The Old Dark House, The Black Cat, things like that, right? Then they finally did Bride of Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and then they did this. And this kind of was one of the last hurrahs. Now, they kept doing them. Like I said, Son of Frankenstein was only three years later, and The Wolfman was right after that. But there was a moment of disinterest in people, especially with the Great Depression going on and stuff, right? That's pretty much an exact replica of the shot of Bela Lugosi. And once again, they don't show us the, the, the vampire getting out of the coffin. But what's really cool is it, it does add into the idea that this first wave of universal horror is bookended by Dracula. And Dracula starts in Transylvania and moves to England. This movie starts in England and then ends in Transylvania. And I think it, it's, it's very appropriate. Because it's like a bookend, and it's really cool. But the universal horror craze did not die out, for sure, at all. Like I said, Son of Dracula came in 1939, and then the Wolfman right after that. That led to a whole bunch more Dracula, Mummy, and Frankenstein, and Wolfman films. And then eventually Creature from the Black Lagoon, and then all the crazy cool atomic Cold War era films. And then horror died out again, came back post-Vietnam or the Vietnam era, came back in the uh, Wall Street corporate greed and distrust of the government in the 80s, and then came back really hardcore post-9-11. It seems like, in American culture at least, there's this idea, and I first heard this idea from Eli, uh, Elliot, um, Eli Roth, and he had this idea that horror has these great booms and waves after, like, big national, like, tragedies. And it is kind of true. Great Depression, right here. You know what I'm saying? World War II, Universal Phase Two. Cold War, those atomic movies. Vietnam, Last House on the Left. Halloween, Suspiria, even though that's not an American film, for sure. But Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Do you get what I'm saying? Post-9-11, Saw, Hostel. There you go. Quentin Tarantino would be an interesting idea to do a movie like this, but I don't know if his style would really work with it. He's definitely more in the 70s vein. He could definitely do something more along the lines of a, a Hammer horror film, for sure. Something like this? You know what? Who know who I want to see tackle something like this? And if Universal really wants to do a, a dark universe, Guillermo del Toro. And get Mike Mignola to do some uh, production design. And film them in black and white. What? No, nah, they wouldn't do that. They don't need to be in black and white. But still, look at that. That's beautiful. The matte paintings, all that stuff. Who knew that Sander was a uh, Hawkeye? <laughs> We're at the climax of the film, obviously. But we're back to Castle Dracula, and I, the same damn spider web is still up, even though Renfield completely... Yeah, but it's the same set. Why not use it, right? It's got to be the same set. But it's a nice way to bookend everything. Oh, back in the day, for sure... Yeah, they didn't realize. These movies weren't even set up like they were all together. And going to the movies was a very much a privilege back in the 30s. They really got even more popular when they got relaunched, you know, and they came back in like double features and stuff in the 50s. And then, of course, it just, what's fascinating about these films is that every generation develops fans of these films. You know, I was born in 1981. And I love these films from the 30s and the 40s so much. Now, I just love classic film. Classic story. I just love story. Whether it's novels, comic books, especially, of course, movies, television. I just love story. But these are some of my favorites. They, they stand the test of time. There's something about it that's, that's so just, it strikes a chord. It, it, it hits a nerve. 
They carry those archetypes. They carry those messages. They have these endearing performances. And once again, it's another movie. You know, these vampire movies in Universal, they don't have the most elaborate makeup effects. It's not like Frankenstein. It's not like the Wolfman. Jack Pierce didn't have too much to do, really, as far as makeup goes. But it still works. They still stand up. They're still iconic. And I think that Zaleska, the Countess, Dracula's daughter, is just as iconic as Bela Lugosi in the role. And if you look at characters that have become very popular as the vampirists, right? They're kind of based on this this look, this this character, just a little bit. Now, her hair is always up, and eventually the hair came down on characters like Vampirella and stuff like that, right? You know, but, you know, look at Adam's family. Look at the monsters. The original House on Haunted Hill with Vincent Price. Hell yeah, that's a great movie. You know, there's a piece of me that likes the one with Jeffrey Rush and uh, Jeremy Combs. A piece. Not the greatest, though. You're insane. I think you really like Creature Feature. It's really respectful of the stuff, especially from the 50s and the 80s. We're right at the very end of this film. Zoxander. He killed his mistress. It's like Castle Grayskull. An arrow through the heart. Look at that set right there, that balcony. The fog, the background, that big-ass curtain. The lighting. <gasps> Just shot that dude. <clears throat> and they're dead. So they build up the Countess to be this like, kind of like, relatable character. And then she just completely gives into her bloodlust. She gives into that temptation, the dark side. So I guess that's the ultimate message of this film is don't give in to that voice inside of you that tells you you're crap. Because you're better than that. You're like Janet. And Dr. Garth. And Van Helsing's going to get away with it because, yeah, she's a vampire. I guess was Sander one of the first familiars in screen? Maybe. Well, no, Ranfield, obviously. And there's the movie. Just like these Universal movies, monster movies, they all end very quickly and abruptly. No time for a resolution. Just the movie's over. There you go. Did you hear that, Kylo Ren? I like that. And once again, there's the cast. Like I said, I love this film. It's fantastic. I really like it. I think it could definitely use a little bit more notoriety, like a little bit more you know, focus on it. And so that's why we did it tonight. So thank you all for joining me here on Frightfully Fearful Fridays at Pop Culture Philosophers here on Rockin' Robbie Live. There will not be a live stream this upcoming Sunday night, but we will be back live next Friday night for another Frightfully Fearful Friday. We're going to be talking about Son of Dracula, which came a little bit later, and it has um, Lon Chaney Jr. as Count Alucard, which happens to be Dracula spelled backwards. If you're a fan of, like, what is it, the Helsing anime, you know, they, they use that. Alucard is used in a lot more vampire fiction onwards, and it's just Dracula spelled backwards. Anyway, Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, doing Son of Dracula. Um, Dracula in the South in the United States, uh, closer to home to me. So it's kind of interesting for that. It's not the greatest movie, but it's all right, and we'll be watching that one next week. So thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. Um, Patreon.com slash PCP. We can help support this channel financially on our journey to get new camera, new video equipment to, to amp up and level up our video production here. But I do got to say thank you right now to our active patrons, David, Alex, Adem, Chamorro Cinema, Nelson, Brian, Dean, Jason, Joe, and Brian. Brian S. Really do appreciate it, everybody. Um, we got 
a fantastic, fearful, fear, frightfully fearful Friday going on. Um, I really do appreciate everything from everybody, um, and we will see you next time. So peace out, everybody.